Hello, and welcome to today's Power of Knowing webinar, Thriving Under Pressure, Benefits of Caregiver Resources. Understanding comes from knowing. Caregiving can be quite challenging. Thriving Under Pressure is a three-part webinar series that will explore the many facets of caregiving. Today is part two of the series, and we will be discussing resources available to assist caregivers of those being discharged from the hospital to another care setting, and those who are already in the community and in need of care and information. The Power of Knowing is a free webinar series created by AuthoraCare Collective, a nonprofit organization that empowers people to be active participants in their care journey through um, enabling them to live on their own terms through personalized support for mind, body, and spirit. To get us started, please welcome our moderator, Risa Hanno. Risa serves as clinical and community educator at AuthoraCare Collective and is also a member of the Cone Health Ethics Committee. She's a licensed clinical social worker. Risa, I turn it over to you. Thank you, Paul. It is my pleasure to introduce our panelists for today's conversation. First, let me introduce Zachary Brooks, Zach is the Cone Health System-Wide Director of the Transitions of Care Department. Zach serves patients and their family members by identifying what is needed for discharge planning, including home health, durable medical equipment, rehabilitation placement, and provision of resources for patients with primary care physician follow-up. Zach started his career in social work 29 years ago after receiving a dual undergraduate degree in social work and political science from UNC Greensboro, and then went on to receive his graduate degree in social work from UNC Chapel Hill. And our other panelist joining us is Geronda Pulliam. Geronda is the Assistant Clinical Director for Ambulatory Care Management at Triad Healthcare Network. Geronda has 33 years of nursing experience, including case management in community and acute care settings. Geronda received her Bachelor's of Science in Nursing and Master's of Science degree in Gerontology from the University of North Carolina at Greensboro and a Postgraduate Certificate Nursing Administration degree from the University of North Carolina, Charlotte. Geronda holds a national certification in case management and also has personal experience as a caregiver. Welcome to both of you. Thank I you. want to also welcome our participants and get to know a little bit who is joining us today. So we have a polling question. This polling question is multiple choice. So please choose all that <coughs> apply to you. It is anonymous. And immediately we see 100% of people saying that they are caregivers. We have a tremendous number of caregivers, which is why we are having this conversation. We also have another, a number of advocates, healthcare professionals, human service professionals joining us. Um, I appreciate, appreciate you taking the time to do this Whole, it is helpful for us to have a sense of who is joining us today. Um, and certainly seeing the number of caregivers joining us lets us know how important this conversation is for all of us. As we begin our conversation today, I do want to point out that we are talking about resources. And please know that tomorrow, everyone who is registered on Zoom will receive a follow-up email. And that email is going to have links to many resources above and beyond what we might even talk about today. So look for that email tomorrow, and it will also have access to the recording from today's conversation. So to go ahead and get us started, Geronda, I, I know that I have been in the situation of thinking, if only I would have known that before. Um, and thinking as a caregiver, 
there are so many things that are helpful to know before we find ourselves either in a crisis or in a situation where information is needed. And for all of the work that you have done professionally, but also personally, what would you say are some important things for us as caregivers to know ahead of time to sort of prepare ourselves and, and have a, a base of information going into that caregiving role? Well, good afternoon, and thank you for asking that question, Risa. There, uh, the first thing to know is who to get information from, and based on the situation, what is the actual need of the person receiving the care. So the caregiver may need to talk with the provider, the uh, practice provider, which could be the doctor or nurse practitioner, or a physician's assistant, talk with their uh, staff at the office to make sure that uh, your needs are understood and what the, the person you're giving care, what they need as well. And I, I appreciate sort of setting that tone and also wanna invite participants that they can submit a question through the Q&A area on the Zoom screen, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Um, so we know we want to ask questions. We want to, but Gerard, I'm also thinking, I don't know what I don't know. Right. Um, so it sounds like our providers, our, our healthcare physicians, and, and those helping in our medical care, are there some other good resources when we're thinking about community that are kind of go-to places for me to, to turn to? Yes. The links that you will provide tomorrow, there's a senior resources of Guilford. I know this may not uh, be just Guilford County participants. There are senior resources links for all of the surrounding counties where you can start there as far as resources. And again, it would be depending on the need. It could be a Department of Social Services. Again, a senior resources uh, in your community. And it could be uh, transportation resources. So it would depend on the need to uh, where you would reach out to. Right. And it's, you know, when when you're a caregiver, depending, again, if it's an acute situation, if it's something planned, and sometimes we need so many of those resources all at the same time. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm thinking about from a insurance, like who pays for these things? Are there, you know, I've been in a situation where there's the thought that, oh, somebody will come into my home and, you know, take care of a loved one. Um, but really so much falls to that caregiver when we're talking about in the community and, and even in some facility settings. Yes, and it is good to be proactive if there's any kind of medical issues that occur or as we continue to age then thinking about what's going to happen in a few years um, based on any kind of experience you may have from friends, other family members, other uh, church members, anyone else that you know in the community, um, what, what would happen if that happened to my family or if that happened to me? Thinking proactively is uh, the first step, but that would help us to not – get into a crisis situation. But as we know, sometimes things happen so suddenly that we don't have time to plan. And uh, as Risa mentioned, then we could go ahead and uh, start maybe writing out some things on paper and uh, thinking about who it is that we could call and uh, moving on from there. And so, Zach, I'm thinking about that when the crisis happens, when a fall happens, a acute illness, and we find ourselves in the hospital. 
Um, many of us want to avoid the hospital, but um, we know that oftentimes we are a caregiver for somebody who does need to be hospitalized at some point. And so what are some things for a caregiver to be thinking about in terms of what do I do? Who do I talk to? That concept or idea of how do I be an advocate? How do I best support um, the person that is in the hospital? Thank you, Risa, for that question. First, I want to acknowledge the caregivers who and professionals and advocates who, who logged on today. I'm glad you could join us. Um, so being a caregiver can be stressful, especially when that medical event hits that you described um, and it results in a hospitalization. Um, this happened to me times two last year when both of my parents ended up at the hospital at the same time. Um, <clears throat> my mother was um, on the cuffs of being discharged. And before she could even get out of the door, here comes my father. <laughs> um, so uh, so he came in. Um, and so we really had it going on. F fortunately for me, I have I have two big sisters um, who are local. And if I'm speaking truthfully today, they shielded me from many of the caregiving duties. Um, but but I still did my part, Risa. <laughs> I still chipped in where I could. Uh, and we worked together to, to pull it off. Um, so I just wanted to say today that regardless of your circumstances, uh, there's help out there. And, and so I will try my best to share from my own personal and professional experiences. But the best advice I can offer um, is to gain a much to what Ron to Geronda said, to gain a full understanding um, of what's occurring with your loved one. Uh, and you can do that by establishing a relationship with the doctor, talking to the nurses, uh, the physical therapist, the pharmacist. Uh, this should be done fairly early in, in the hospital stage, just to give you uh, the time to plan accordingly. Um, so once you have a good idea of what's going on from a medical standpoint, then begin thinking about what home is going to look like uh, once your loved one arrives. So I, I do have some, some considerations. Um, I have six things that you might want to uh, consider as a caregiver or an advocate or, or a family member that's uh, helping out. Uh, so the first thing is make sure the home is safe and accessible. Mm -hmm. um, are there stairs leading into the home? Um, let's say if your loved one is ordered medical equipment, um, is there enough space in the home um, for that medical equipment? Um, what about the utilities? Any Anything going on with the utilities? Um, is there a home to go to? Uh, you know, is going back home a good idea? And I can talk about that um, here in just a little bit. Um, so that that's the first thing. The second consideration uh, is some something that's often overlooked, um, and that's whether or not there's adequate food in the home. So many individuals leave the hospital on special diets, aren't healthy. That that seems to be the the favorite one here at uh, Moses Cone, where they do a lot of heart surgeries. Uh, Many individuals are directed to take medications with food. And for those recovering from wounds, nutrition is critical. Um, so is is the is the food situation uh, where it should be? So that, that that's that's a consideration. Um, a third consideration, and this is something else that's often overlooked, uh, but transportation, you know, mm -hmm. who's going to the pharmacy to pick up the medications? Uh, you know, who's going to the grocery store to, to pick up the food? Um, that was my role as a caregiver when my parents got sick. That I got pegged with that one. You could do that. <laughs> yeah, I did that one. Um, so, you know, and then, you know, who's providing transportation so that that individual can get to their next doctor's appointment? Mm -hmm. um, which brings me to the fourth consideration, and that is the doctor's appointment. So, uh, if you if you are a caregiver or a family member or an advocate, um, make sure your loved one has 
a follow-up appointment. All, all patients that leave hospitals should have a follow-up appointment with their primary care physician. And make sure the appointment time and date jives with your schedule. Um, it, it's not uncommon to be so busy with a discharge that you know everybody's giving you information. Um, but really focus in on when that doctor's appointment is going to be and whether or not as a caregiver, um, you can help that individual make their follow-up appointment. Follow-up appointment, appointments are really vital uh, to the sustainability of whatever medication treatment was started um, at the hospital. And physicians get the information from the hospital. Um, but that, that first literature states that, that that first appointment after a hospitalization uh, is, is critical in, in long-term wellness. Um, so transportation uh, and, and the follow-up appointment. The fifth consideration um, is assessing yourself um, as someone that's going to be in good position to be that caregiver. Mm -hmm. So that this is like stepping back, being honest with yourself based on all the circumstances that you uh, have learned as a result of the hospitalization. It's really um, asking yourself, is this going to be sustainable? Um, is, is this task too tall uh, for me to manage? Um, am I going to need help? Um, am I am I in position to do the bathing, the dressing, the cleaning of the home? So it's really a self assessment. You know, are you are you ready? It's it's okay. Uh, we we forgive you if 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 you can't uh, if you aren't in position to do that. So don't don't feel like you have to. There, there's help out here. Um, and I started um, started off with with the help that's available. Um, so this brings me to to number six, um, which is um let, let's say let me let me give the scenario let, let's say our loved one was not progressing well in the hospital like we anticipated uh, we realized that going home was not going to be an option you know without some additional resources or let's say there was resources but just wasn't enough um where you would consider home a valuable option uh, that that happens too um, so the good news is that hospitals have social workers, case managers, or, or both uh, that can help you navigate through all the discharge planning possibilities uh, based on your goals and your preferences. Uh, so by and large, Risa, we get um, a large volume of, of nursing home placement requests. Um, we also set up home health and, uh, you know, for those that can go home safely and have the support. Um, we set up durable medical equipment. Um, and so that that's those are just some of, of our um, interventions. But again, each, each situation is special and uh, we try to tailor that discharge plan to whatever it is uh, the family needs. And I, I love that list. And what comes to my mind is so I started out as a hospital social worker, mm -hmm. but that was 35 years ago. Mm -hmm. And things happen a lot quicker in a hospital than they did when I was a hospital social worker. Um, so help us, I mean, from the time somebody's in an emergency room or from the time they get admitted, we really, as a caregiver, need to be advocating. So do I say to the nurse at the nurse station, I need to talk to somebody about plans for going home, or will somebody come to me without me asking? How, how does that happen? And I realize it's not the same everywhere, but right. time is so valuable, but yet it can be hard to ask, especially if I don't feel empowered or equipped. Right. So um, one of the things that, that we're doing um, here at Cone Health is we, we have um, communication boards uh, in all of the rooms um, and on the communication board. And the communication board is, is for patients, it's for family members, it's for whoever goes in that room. Uh, but the communication board uh, 
provides information um, on who is who are members of the health healthcare team. Uh, so the doctor's name is on there, the nurse's name. Um, it lists like what the goals are. Um, sometimes it, it lists like who the social worker and, and case manager is that you can contact if you have any questions. Um, so that that's one of the things that um, we do to help families. Um, uh, in addition, one of our goals is to um, assess each situation as, you know, as close to the beginning as possible um, to assess um, for, for needs. Um, we have patient-centered um, um, meetings each morning uh, to talk about each individual's uh, needs. And if, if um, there's a need that services uh, around discharge planning, then our teams make sure we, re we reach out uh, to family me members and, and we're proactive uh, as well. So, yeah, I, we have had, um, let's see, somebody said that they used to arrange for their mom to receive her meds during delivery the majority of time. And it was great. And mm -hmm. Garanda and, and I'm thinking about there are different services, right? Different pharmacies um, that can be helpful because not every person can take medication independently or um, just, as we said, transportation. And I wonder, Deronda, can you talk a little bit about medication? I mean, it's vital that it's taken. Doses can change. Not everybody has somebody there with them as a caregiver. How can I be proactive around that, that topic of the medication? Well, Risa, I want to add on in, uh, to some of the things that Zach mentioned, because when they are in the hospital or in a different setting than home, and they need to come back home or back out into the community, then uh, some of those things are very much intertwined. While the person is uh, in the inpatient setting or in the emergency department, it is good to have uh, paperwork, a discharge summary, <clears throat> excuse me, an after visit summary, information that would be clear for that person to read ensuring that it is in their appropriate language and that they understand what needs to be done uh, to follow up with their care. <clears throat> so that could be whether they have the home health, the home health nurse may be able to help starting out with um, showing them how to fill a medication pill box or uh, making sure that they get their medicines on the way home, that the prescriptions have been sent in to their uh, pharmacy that they usually use. They may need to stop by and pick up a new medicine on the way home until they can get things set up through a delivery system. There are several different systems where you, uh, of course, get them in the pill bottles, but you can also get uh, pill packs if someone is uh, can open open them appropriately as far as how they're uh, sealed and their de dexterity getting into the medicines. They can be um, put in different times of the day in the same little bubble pack. There are some uh, pharmacies that deliver. Now, more so after the pandemic, there's a lot more that deliver and it may be a delivery fee, but again, that is a, a convenience to some of our uh, members of the community. So that's something to make sure that they have the appropriate medicines and in caregiving that it is understood if that person can uh, give their own medicines or if they need some assistance. Someone may just need you to open the bottle and, and have the medicines out for them. And as not being able to pay for the medicine. That's mm -hmm. what I was. Yeah. <laughs> that's you had mentioned Medicare earlier, as far as uh, as payment. Now, um, as Risa stated, insurances may not pay for 100% of everything. Medicare does not cover several different things. So it is um, if you have 
any particular kind of insurance, that is something to also understand, even if you don't go into the hospital, what type of co-payments you may have, what your insurance health plan actually covers as far as uh, do you have a Medicare Part D, which is for the medications, different than a Part A and a Part B. And if there's medicines that uh, may be newer out on the market, they may cost more than um, the generic brand, which has been along for several years. So there are programs that hopefully someone at the provider's office can assist with or anyone else that you are working with in the community to apply on um, online on the Internet at some of the pharmacy companies for assistance where you'd be able to get a certain amount uh, per month instead of the full cost of the medicine. Mm -hmm. And again, uh, with any other type of equipment, any other type of uh, services needed that are going to be in the home or in the community, that's another thing to check for the insurance to see who covers um, actually what type of services, whether that is uh, physical therapy coming out, what the copayment would be, um, how many visits that the insurance would pay for initially, occupational therapy that may help with um, dressing, feeding, different than physical therapy with uh, just getting up, walking, and mobility. So there's a, a lot of different things that occur once they are in the home or if they want to remain in the home that can assist. Yeah, somebody put a comment. Um, I arranged to have a nurse come to the home on a monthly basis to avoid hospital emergency visits and um, also going to a specialist. So there are some situations where that type of service might be covered because it's maybe a skilled need or something that the doctor has ordered for physical therapy or some other particular care, either related to a hospital stay or not. But sometimes people purchase or can pay for some private duty help, which of course requires the ability to pay for it. And some insurance companies even have somebody who might come and check or there, there's such a range. And I'm wondering, Geronda, like, who do I talk to? I mean, how do I, how do I find out? And you said, you know, I need to find out what my insurance covers. Who, who am I calling? Who am I asking that of? Well, again, if someone has not been in the hospital, the uh, the key to getting this process started is with the primary provider, which um, all of us should have, depending on the age, no matter the circumstance, if they're relatively healthy or if they have multiple medical problems. The key to starting that is the primary care provider. They, um, they can refer you to someone out in the community, definitely at least have a month of an annual wellness visit which is that once a year visit to make sure that everything is um, okay, nothing has changed, or if anything has changed, that it can be addressed from the prior year. So having an annual wellness visit, or some may call it just your um, yearly physical with the doctor. And But if something occurs before that, then the key is to getting to your medical provider and uh, explaining what's happening. They may be able to refer you to a, uh, a different type of case management service, or they may be able to get you to um, recommend something like senior resources that would be able to give you a, a better idea of who to reach out to. There are um, agencies, as Risa mentioned, that you could uh, if you have the ability to private pay, to hire uh, a nurse assistant or um, have a nurse to come out to visit a certain amount of times during the month. So some of those do not require 
a doctor's order depending on the need of the uh, of the person and the caregiver. So Zach, I'm thinking about um, for you, it's you, you have your sisters. Not everybody has local caregivers and not every caregiver is physically able, um, as we've mentioned, to take care of someone. Being a caregiver is hard and exhausting. And thinking about the situation where going home is not possible. And talk to us a little bit about that process, because it really is a process to, um, I don't always get to decide where my, my loved one might go from the hospital for rehabilitation or longer term care at a facility. Tell us about that process and, and how that works. So we, we always start with the goals and preference, preferences of the family. And, um, you know, we, we assess the insurance to see what, what the patient is eligible for. Um, and we look to our therapists, too, um, who provide uh, physical therapy evaluations um, j just to gain an understanding of, of what the recommendation uh, could look like. Uh, and then we take that and we, we work with the families. Um, so, um, Risa, are you talking about skilled nursing facility placement in that process? or Yeah, um, yeah. so I'm thinking I thought I was going to go home, but I find out that either, you know, the, the rehabilitation after a stroke is too overwhelming or maybe my loved one has dementia and we've been back and forth to the hospital six or seven times and being the caregiver is overwhelming for me. And I think emotionally it's hard to make that decision, but it's also a, a complicated process to, to understand. It, it, it is. Um, and one of the top questions that we get is, is, well, how's this going to get covered if we, mm -hmm. um, you know, to decide to do this or that, um, but with skilled nursing facility care, let, let's let's say if home is not an option, um, and skilled nursing is, you know, the viable option, um, then we we get we seek insurance authorization um, on the hospital side. We seek authorization, um, and we have a lot of success at, at getting short term stays at a skilled nursing facility covered. Um, Oddly enough, nursing homes also have social workers and case managers. Um, and, you know, e even though we, we get two weeks up front most of the time or, or one week, um, there are social workers at skilled facilities that can um, ask, advocate for additional time at a skilled nursing facility. Um, and they also set up home plans, too, at skilled nursing facilities. So the, the continuum uh, goes as, as the person moves through uh, the different stages of, of where they, they, they are. Now, um, there's also a level of care called inpatient rehab. Um, and so that's another option for family members, especially you said stroke. Um, so when I think stroke, I, I think of inpatient rehab, which, which is a comprehensive rehab that's done on site, um, and there there are other um, inpatient rehabs um, in the area, um, but this involves um, more aggressive therapy, uh, and it's geared to be short term in nature. Uh, and again, even in that setting, they also have social workers and case managers uh, that help with discharge planning. So no matter where you go, th there's um, professionals in place that that can help um, you plan ahead for for the next step. And so, uh, and and Risa, if I could add on to that, as um, Zach mentioned earlier, thinking about not only if they're in the hospital or if something happens and they're within the home, who is going to assist us? It may be just a couple. It may be a, a child 
and an adult or, you know, an adult child with an older parent or a, a part, partner assisting another partner. So it is where people will tell you, um, hopefully, well, let us know if you need anything or uh, and sometimes we kind of want to do things ourselves. <clears throat> that may be human nature for a lot of us. But if people offer to help, no matter whether it's to bring a meal, no matter whether it is to kind of come over and give you a break to go to the grocery store or to go to the hair salon or to go to the barber shop, um, utilize those folks that may say, and hopefully they mean it when they say, let me know if you need anything. So it may be just, you know, you're exhausted and you need them to come over and do some light housekeeping. And uh, friends, family, church members, anything like that. And uh, it's called um, getting respite services. There may be some of the um, our senior resources in the community that provide that as well. And also, um, again, considering as a caregiver, in the event of a crisis or in the event that something happens, then if you're not able to physically or mentally assist the person as much as needed, because um, as as an adult daughter, I never thought that I would have to give my father a bath. But um, having advanced Alzheimer's and um, losing the ability to be mobile, that was something I had to assist in. But that's different because I'm a nurse. But someone may, someone else may be very uncomfortable with that. Um, and those are the kind of things we have to think through. The type of uh, physical therapy may be something we would also have to understand of, am I going to be able to get this person up the six steps seven steps to the upstairs bedroom or do I need to request to have a hospital bed downstairs in our den so there's a lot of different things to think about that and um, and accessing support groups because hearing someone else go uh, talk about going through the same thing we are very rarely alone in our situation and bouncing ideas off of others, getting that uh, feedback from others, what they may have done in the same or similar situations helps. Yeah. And if uh, and applying for other financial assistance, if Medicare does not cover, such as um, a subsidy or Medicaid, depending on uh, the financial situation in the household. Right. I think about Medicaid. I think about checking if somebody was a veteran, whether there are resources. Um, and to this conversation, somebody has shared, my parents are 85 years old and they are in the early stages of Alzheimer's dementia. I live and work full time in Greensboro and they're in a rural area that's an hour away, an hour and a half away. They want to remain in their home. I want to find a caregiver for them. But how can I find a caregiver I trust if I'm not there? We already had problems with home health care coming after a hospitalization. They told them not to come back. This is very stressful because I can't spend a lot of time going to their home. The Council on Aging is in many counties, but doesn't cover anything in their county. So mm -hmm. there's a whole lot in that in that question that I think so many caregivers, it, this, this probably is their situation. So I'm the caregiver, but I'm working full time. I mean, Zach, when we think about help in the home, sometimes I think about, I want an individual, but an individual, um, how do I, Vet them. How do I make sure they might be less expensive, but they might not be checked out the same way as if I utilize a private company and I might not be able to afford it. I mean, it's such a hard situation. Yeah. And just just speaking personally, um, you know, but before my parents, uh, but um, with my aunt, we, we um, utilized a 
uh, neighbor um, that we've known for like, you know, 40, 50 years, um, who happened to be um, a CNA. Um, and so, and, and my aunt felt comfortable um, with her because she had known her for, for years. Um, so, so I consider that like kinship care where, where you know, you, you, you pull on those who are like really close to you. Um, but, you know, if, if that type of resource is not available, um, then there, there are private duty um, or um, companies that um, some pro are providers. They actually provide the services. Um, you know, they, they're um, vetted in the sense that they are um, licensed and bonded mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to do that work. Um, and then you have companies that actually um, do do the headhunting, like a place for mom, but you have um, a company that, that does vets other uh, private duty uh, resources. Um, so that that that's um, a possibility. Um, and then there's also the day programs, um, you know, that are out there. So you know, one one thing that. Um, families are considering our day programs because they are working and they are, you know, their parents could be, you know, could have been somebody that was active um, at one point and now they're at home and they, you know, after retirement, there's not much, you know, going on there um, for, for a lot of people as they age. Um, uh, so day programs. Um, so you know, are you talking about like adult day health I've, or like uh and particularly for those maybe with a memory issue or um so a safe place to go maybe lunch is served and for some safe, of our outlying communities that still could be an option for us to look into i would say it's worth exploring i, I don't know how how rural that the um, participant is um but um there could be um you know some some of those programs close by um mm -hmm. uh, transportation services um are out there that you know are willing to go beyond a certain distance um but but it's worth exploring right thank you yes and um as yeah. you as you stated risa there may be minimal services as in the rural areas, the further you get out, there um, may be less services. Uh, if there is internet available in that area, and if uh, even though, you know, the parents may not use the computer per se, but if there's internet availability, there have been a lot of caregivers who have purchased a very cost-effective, very reasonable a camera system to mm -hmm. where that's something that could ease minds into, well, I'm not able to get out there right now, or I'm able to come just a couple of days a week, then I can have this, I can just pull that up on my telephone or on my computer and visualize what's going on out there. But again, that's where, um, that is the stressful part of being a caregiver is being able to trust someone to come in the home, um, a family friend, again, church members, anyone that says, if you need anything or if I can help, let me know. Um, some may do it out of the goodness of their heart. Some would be definitely um, cost less than an agency per se. Mm -hmm. And somebody has commented that adult daycare was so close to my work that I was able to go take my parents at least once a week and go to my office for several hours. So yes. when we think about adult daycare, I know that there are many different types. Sometimes it is that respite. I go, um, I, I bring my loved one for four hours once a week or twice a week, and other people go for full days every day of the week and and there are different availabilities and and different arrangements um somebody else has commented about respite for caregivers is a great resource the county i live in provided me with 20 minutes of respite every three months via a grant 
I could do my personal errands while a nurse assistant from an agency came to take care of my mom. Unfortunately, I used it one time and then mom passed away. Um, mm -hmm. So oh, 20 hours, yeah, 20 minutes. So 20 hours every three months. So Geronda, I think back to that point of trying to find out what is available. I mean, some things are individual specific, like illness specific, or if I'm a veteran, some things are my coverage. Some things are the county I live in because there might be a, a grant or a resource in one county that's not in another county. So it sounds like we really as caregivers need to do what you're saying, which is ask a lot of questions. Right. Ask a lot of questions. Um, and we will we will need to trust someone with some minimal information. Um, you don't have to give the entire medical history or the entire life history, just letting them know what the need is. Um, there are a lot of associations for disease specific, like um, ALS, MS, the um, Cancer Association, some of the American Heart or American Stroke Associations. And those, um, if you do have internet access and you are a, a savvy with looking at some things. Again, um, Reese is going to send out information where you'll be able to just click on links and go right to those websites and uh, letting them know your specific needs and they may be able to assist with that. If the person is what's considered service connected and with the with the Veterans Administration, They've served in um, a war from, you know, World War II up until uh, the war in 1990 with Afghanistan, Iran. So there are a lot of different things available, not only for uh, the retirees, but for their dependents as well. They may be able to get spousal benefits. So I'm thinking as a caregiver, you just you said something that really clicked for me, which is sharing information. And we know, unfortunately, there are a lot of um, scams. There are a lot of, um, unfortunately, people trying to take advantage perhaps of our caregivers and our seniors. And as a caregiver, um, it seems to me really making sure that our loved one is protected from those things, um, keeping an eye on maybe where checks are being written or who they're letting into the house. I mean, that's another role as a caregiver that I think, unfortunately, we have to think about and mm -hmm. um, the safety of that senior. Um, and we as a caregiver, how do we know who to trust? Yeah. And um, not necessarily as a senior, but it could be a younger person with a disability that, mm -hmm. um, is receiving care or has a caregiver. Um, as I mentioned, minimal information in order to get processes started. Um, just the disease process for how many years. And but definitely not giving out any kind of um, information such as never give out social security number unless you're like right in the office with that person face to face and uh, it is a legitimate program not giving out bank account information, uh, not sending checks or getting gift cards or um, any kind of money orders to send to anyone. And it seems as if you send a charitable organization a one-time um, one time check for something, then a plethora will start coming in. You will get uh, maybe from one or two charities that you're of your favorite that you like to give during the year, but then you may get uh, 20 responses from other charities because unfortunately the names are passed along to um, to other organizations and groups. The uh, sheriff's department or the police department calling for um, or firemen calling for any type of charitable donations. Those are people that we trust and we definitely want to give to them. But be very careful on um, on what you give or you can 
just let them know, oh, well, I'll bring something by. Which station do I need to bring it by? Instead of giving them a credit card number over the phone or your checking account information. Mm-hmm. So it is very um, – these days and ages, we just have to be very careful as a um, caregiver. It can be very difficult to take over the um, bank accounts. And to and it may be just to make sure that bills are being paid for someone with Alzheimer's or dementia. It may be that um, to make sure they have groceries in the home, that groceries need to be purchased. Or, um, you know, again, you don't want to get start getting any kind of letters of being sent to the creditors or lots of bills piling up. And then uh, you're owing a lot of people because you don't know how the finances have been going. So even a shared account would be very helpful is um, even with someone who we're close to caregiving. So Zach, that makes me think about um, two things. One is there are some situations where applying for Medicaid um, is necessary and appropriate But there also sometimes feels like there is a hesitancy or, I mean, that does require sharing a lot of information. And and sometimes we have a hesitancy to do that either because of the information or even a stigma around Medicaid. But Medicaid can be the bridge to so many different caregiving options, whether it's out of home placement or some in-home programs. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that because that impacts so many people. Yeah, so believe it or not, yeah, Medicaid can be the key to so many um, resources. Um, For example, the the CAP program that's run through DSS. Uh, The CAP program provides up to, I mean, it's multiple hours of, caregiving services in the home um, once Medicaid is is awarded. Um, And so um, this this conversation occurs in the hospital um, because families will will ask, you know, what what types of services are there for the home? Home health only covers a visit or two here and there. Same with hospice. We are important, but we are intermittent in our Exactly, exactly. So what a lot of families are wanting is that they're wanting like somebody that could be there eight hours. Um, and so we, we we do have conversations about uh, applying for Medicaid um, and we connect families with Medicaid workers to, to get that the process started. Um, and that, that's one of the things we do. That That's the case for long term nursing home placement. Um, and so, and I'm not talking about skilled nursing, I'm talking about long-term nursing home care, which is covered by Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, yeah, it's, it's not uncommon for, um, someone that, that is older to, to outlive their resources. Um, but that situation can, can occur. Um, and sometimes Medicaid is, is the right path to take, um, there sometimes is a spin down process, and this this is why it's important to speak to a Medicaid worker because they have all the ins and outs. Um, but there's criteria uh, to to qualify, uh, and it's and some, county based. Is that correct? The Department of Social Services for applying for Medicaid is county based. Correct, correct. So you know wherever the individual resides, that's where you you uh, need to apply for the Medicaid. Um, So one other thing before we come to the end of our time, I'm thinking Mm -hmm. about, we've been talking about being a caregiver and the responsibility, Mm -hmm. certainly seeking support. The other thing that comes to my mind is advanced care planning. And Mm -hmm. Zach, I'm thinking about, I mean, that can be done in the community, certainly, but I'm correct when somebody is admitted to the hospital, there's a conversation. Is there whether somebody has what we might know as a living will or a healthcare power of attorney to make decisions if I am not able to do that. That sounds like 
an important part of our process for our conversation if I'm going to be a caregiver. Uh, absolutely. In, in fact, um, we seek out those healthcare power of attorney um, forms if, if somebody is presenting themselves as a caregiver who's, who's the power of attorney. So um, we, we ask for those uh, to be brought in so we can have scanned and, and submitted into our medical record. Um, but f for those um, seeking to establish a uh, decision maker, um, we offer um, completing those healthcare power of attorneys here in the hospital, um, wh which is important. Um, that that's really v vital because it does help out with decision making. Um, you know, we, we know who to um, contact um, to make some of these decisions, like Medicaid and and um, what the options are. Um, so ab absolutely, we we support the completion of those. Um, and we identify those kind of early on so we, we'll know what the what the wishes are of, of the person that's that we're serving. And if I can also um, add on to that in the community, if you are not going into the hospital, but as, as I mentioned earlier, going to visit your uh, doctor for your annual physical, annual wellness visit, they should be asking about advanced directives, advanced care planning, or um, living will, which is uh, while you're still living, not the will that um, addresses your belongings or your um, anything that you own after you pass away. So that is a way for people to make it known that, you know, I, I don't want to have tube feedings. I don't want to have... Um, CPR, I don't want to be on a breathing machine, or they may want all of that, depending on the situation. Um, and if they are in a, a progressing disease process. So uh, the providers should be discussing that as well. Um, they should also provide a packet of information or some type of a pamphlet to explain that more. And it's really to make sure that you get the care that you want and that um, you make sure that the person you're caring for gets the care they want and they deserve or something they may not want. So that's where that is the most important to um, have that information and discuss it with um, your family and friends if you're not the sole caregiver. And can I add on, uh, add on to that, Risa? I know we're almost at time, but yes. there, there, there's another uh, piece. Uh, that I wanted to add. So it, it's, um, and I see this a lot um, on the inpatient side, but um, sometimes uh, we, we need a finance, somebody that's a financial right. um, representative as, as well, because what, what happens is, um, let's say if the individual is not eligible for uh, Medicaid, uh, and they have to spend down their assets, um, you know, there needs to be a financial uh, power of attorney who can access bank accounts uh, to even share with a Medicaid worker um, yeah. for, for application um, purposes. Um, so, yeah, so that that that's important. I, I wish we had more time. I could go into to some of the examples. But, <laughs> well, uh, this conversation <laughs> has been Fabulous. And I, I thank you both for your expertise and, and your care that you not only showed today, but show every day. And I um, want to thank the participants and invite everyone to join us two weeks from today. We're going to continue this conversation and we're going to really be talking about overcoming some of those barriers. So making sure that our veterans know how to access care some groups who are not always treated um, with equity, our African-American, our people of color, um, groups that may sometimes not get all of the care that they deserve and may face some barriers to care. We're going to be really focusing in on that and we invite you to um, join that conversation. And I wanna thank everyone who has participated today. As we've mentioned, You'll be receiving an email tomorrow with many, many links 
You can also respond to the email back to me. I will try to answer any questions or pass them on to Zach and Geronda. Um, and as we close, I just want to share a quote, which is, the closest thing to being cared for is to care for someone else. And Carson McCullers, um, an author, said that. So thank you all for joining us. And um, I hope everyone has a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.